Good evening. Uh, I'm Milton Curry, Dean of the USC School of Architecture, and Della and Harry McDonald, Dean's Chair in Architecture. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Fall 2020 Public Event Series. Our speaker this evening, Gabriela Echegare, will speak for about 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A moderated by Marco Sanchez, lecturer at our school. Programming support for this lecture is made possible by the Sharon and Mauricio Oberfeld Fund for USC Architecture Global Studies Program in Mexico City. USC Architecture is a global platform for the study of architecture, landscape architecture, conservation, building technology and performative systems, urbanism and city design, and social practice. The interface between form and function, urbanism at scale and at the intimacy of a private garden, between citizen and city, the political and the social, art and architecture, that's more and more where the central questions of our time are occupying architects, designers, and thinkers. The siloed domains of research, practice, client, user, in many ways is old news. The new paradigm will favor praxis and integrated intellectual and systems thinking, where expertise is overlapping. The ability to achieve innovative results will, will be the measure of success. It is in that context that our school pursues global programs in teaching and research that include the full constellation of architecture thinking. It is why I've been and continue to be working with artists and architects in Mexico City and across Latin America, where the unique cultural histories and contemporary imprints of colonialism are vexing, intriguing, and continue to inspire unique forms of interdisciplinary creativity that defines a creative class, particularly in Mexico City. Our speaker this evening, Gabriela Echegare, emblematizes this creativity. She studied architecture at Universidad Iberoamericana and subsequently studied with a master in creative management and transformation in the city at the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya. Recently, she studied critics and curating, criticism and curating at Columbia University in New York. She is co-founder of Ambrosi Echegare, an architecture studio based in Mexico City since 2011 in partnership with Jorge Ambrosi. She holds an MS in critical curatorial and conceptual practices in architecture from Columbia University and was appointed curator for the Mexican Pavilion at the 2018 Venice Biennale. Selected by the architectural record as design vanguard in 2017, and receiving the recognition of emerging voices by the Architectural League of New York in 2015, she recently founded LIA, Place, Medium, and Space, to express theoretical, mediatic, artistic, and discursive proposals free from the domain and or traditional expectations that promote a limited vision of architecture. She's recently won the Moira Gemil Emerging Architecture Award from the Women in Architecture Awards Group, I'm so pleased to have Gabriella joining us today. Um, we'd love to have her here in Los Angeles, but um, at another time. But, but for now, we're very pleased to have you uh, today. Welcome, Gabriella. Hi. Um, good night. Good evening. And thank you, Milton, for this introduction, also for the invitation. And um, I'm looking forward for the next invitation to actually to properly be you know, on campus. Um, but at the moment, thank you for everyone who's um, connected and, and a little disconnected from what's going on with um, politics and in general in the world. And because of these reasons, I decided um, that today's conversation is going to be about embodies at place. To, to talk about some reflections that have been in the work of the office at, at the, uh, through these moments um, of confinement. And I think we all sort of like share a common experience where we have gotten more conscious about our bodies, how we relate to one another, how we, um, 
say how, the space in which our bodies move, touch, don't touch, and what and how they take place. From a literal concern with the relationship between architecture and the bodies to strictly figurative one. So today, um, the idea to take place as an individual action seems to open up a world of possibilities in order to understand the complexities of our interactions in a specific context. First of all, we think that we must recognize that our human bodies are connected to other kinds of bodies. Bodies that address different forms, such as infrastructure, landscape, communities, economies, among others. Such bodies act like, a thre like threads that are related to one another, all interconnected at the same time. Second, and most importantly, uh, we believe that we must understand that our bodies have the possibility of a greater reach that goes beyond the condition of our physical body. This means that our interconnected existence is actually a coexistence, where our actions have implication with multiple bodies. Uh, the previous premises require us to look further and at a different and, and through different scales. Only, only by acknowledging our extent, our extended ex uh, existence, we will be fully responsible for the actions we develop when we take a place. With this in mind, and following the free space motto by Grafton Architects for the Venice Biennale 2018. Um, in which we understood the concept of free space as all the conceivable possibilities at an undefined space, but, at the, but then again defined by the land. Um, we wanted to, to deepen our understanding of the territory in Mexico as a country. Using architectural tools of representation, we sought to show a territory of contrast, a territory where certain voids or free spaces can only highlight the lack of long-term and short-term compromises of the space we inhabit. Um, a territory where the territorial incomprehension leads to areas where, with extreme poverty and natural disasters, where the government's absence does not design policies for protecting area, green areas, such as high-risk regions to be inhabited, and those with almost no infrastructure. Through an investigation of Anthropography, the pavilion of Echoes of a Land, um, with the, type, the, the pavilion that we titled Echoes of a Land, developed through an overlay of map um, to reflect on the dimensions or scale of the urbanization and the territory, where the dichotomy between natural environment and anthropographic transformations are linked as well to one another. The exhibition Echoes of a Land was based on the language of art, of muralist art, essentially Mexican history as a movement to thought, mainly to reactivate reconstruction processes and collective identities after the, re the revolution. In order to rescue a discourse of identity, the research reveal, reveals the extent and relationship between the country or urban and rural continuum. The reflection and presented a series of projects in the center of the, uh, of the country. These projects were requirements from the institutions in charge in which we aim to show the scale of action in relationship to a, to a geography. Questioning the domain of, interve of intervention and the size of contemporary challenges. It attempts to call uh, an interdisciplinary perspective as well as to understand complex processes that act as hand in, act hand in hand with ecological and social dynamics. The section at the center of the pavilion suggested the link of the two main murals. Both murals act as a, as, as a facade in order for the space to be contained and play, the con, play, play contrasting perspectives. One about the qualities and richness of a vast land and the other showing the catastrophe caused by natural dis disaster and human negligence from the last Biennale to this one. The section, however, goes from the east coast of the Mexican Gulf to the west coast where the main maritime port operates. Such sections trace alludes to the expedition of Alexander von Humboldt in the same region. 
an expedition that, that crossed the center of the country, one that revealed and presented the ecological pressures created, generated by the new volcanic axis, a land rich in water and species that gave birth to the most significant human settlements of the territory, where today happen to be the largest and main cities in the country of Mexico City. The, the model of the section in combination with the drawing where the diversity of ecosystems were central, acts as an exercise of synthesis of different information that is relevant in understanding of a frame territory. After the, the Venice Biennial exhibition, we wanted to continue with the exercise of representation and we turned the gaze to the borders of Mexico. The territory of Mexico as the US territory is limited by the sea at the east and the west coordinates where the water conditions defines those geographical borders. To the north and south, the geopolitical borders are represented by a line that, that it intends to separate the neighboring reality. But in fact, it acts more as a scar to a larger territory. The drawing of a line reflects on the different conditions that each side represents, acknowledging that neither of the political borders delimits the territory. We recognize that the political borders does not describe the complexity of the conditions on the common ground where two or more countries meet. The line is the abstract result of political and historical decisions that result in arbitrary limits. The geopolitical border has been guided by physical obstacles, including rivers and topographic elevations. At other extent, the tracing of the border was ignored the, uh, has ignored the former inhabitants and biomes of the different regions. At the end, such lines carry political and symbolic meaning disconnected from the physical characteristics of the territory. It certainly does not determine where the identity of one ends and the other begins. Instead of assuming a restrictive role as containment, the border should be presented as an ecotone, where natural ecoregions connect with other ecosystem and social groups a place for hybridization, a place of connection, where different bodies, as I said before, other kinds of bodies interact, exchange, and combine. In fact, the border, the border could become a place in its extent, not a line, where different cultural, social, physical, geographic, environmental, and economic structures meet and complement one another. The, and, this exercise sort of like um, had two paths. One to sort of like continue on the graphic representation and architectural language and forms of another, through another forms of knowledge in our work. And also, um, I hope that I'm clear that the territory is not the word that refers to an extension of our country. In fact, its territory is a complex definition that can be addressed at different scales and relationships depending on the area of study and the approach. So going back to the present moment where our bodies have been limited within the space of our home, at the time we were asked or even forced to limit our activities within the domestic space, we have had an opportunity uh, under these uh, confine, confinement conditions to rethink the life we were living. The reason of the relationship the reason as well as the relationship and so on. It has exposed the change uh, of consumption and the necessities of our interaction at, at, the, at a capitalist model. Situations that are no longer questioned, that were no longer questioned in a daily basis are, are, and are now the new focus of our attention. In Mexico, the, the instinct for survival has for citizens to choose between their personal care by staying at home for the benefit of their health or to opt to continue with their work as ordinary um, as it used to be ordinary to maintain any possible income that somehow also fits their benefit um, and their benefit of their health. This dichotomy evidences the, the social gap where differences are being enlarged and sharpened by the pandemic. The less privileged health 
sectors of the population have been exposed to higher risk with their ongoing life, uh, daily life activities. While the more privileged sector is working as a home office or even holiday office at different destinations. At the same time, the withdrawal of an exterior life has accelerated the lack of separation between the basic human activities, home, work, education, and place have become an undifferentiated continuum. The border of each has been dissolved in the fluids of the domestic realm. While exposing our immediate urban context, its imbalances, its dislocations and inequalities. These conditions awaken a greater, a greater awareness of the hyperlocal, which reveals the importance of questionings about the basic needs, even the essentials, in order to imagine possible future uh, possible futures in seek, in seek of equality. The model of uh, the model of more through luxury and possession must be pushed to reimagine the economic system. We need to take care of ourselves in a more conscious manner. We've fallen into a similar approach as the Pythagoreans or the Epicureans did. That is to take care of life habits, to be aware of the diet consumed, the physical exercises, uh, as well as the mental ones. So we're not far from that, uh, from what the classic Greeks understood as care back then. How could we weave a more complex network of care? We also look back to the monastic life as Pierre Vittorio Relli um, uh, presents in his essay, Less is Enough, where, they review, where he reviews the principles that guide a life of, of, of austerity in Franciscan monks, as well as a contemporary life, where the acknowledgement of the essential needs of oneself meets the common ground, the common good. We could question today, what do we consider as an extension of the domestic, what falls outside the home? What are those intermediate spaces that foster community? Um, and to present another idea, Palasma insists on the need to reclaim the body to revalue the place. In his book, The Eyes of Skin, he justifies that if architecture wants to guarantee a sense of place, it must consider the body and its experience of the place through all its senses. Prioritizing one sense to the detriment of others is mutilating the experience, impoverishing it. On the contrary, promoting the entire sensory experience of the body is an enrichment because it makes the experience of the place more concrete and unique and accentuates its different sets with respect to other space, with other places. The assemblage of the latter ideas aims to explore the meaning of austerity in order to redefine the idea of luxury. Working in collaboration with local artisans and designers, we try to define the essential elements for a luxury hotel inside, a, inside an 1800 house in Mexico City historic center. Understanding that all bodies are interconnected Art and, and that architecture is no different, we raise fundamental questions towards the discipline of architecture that fall in the notion of limit, typology, and program. We played around the typology of the hotel, merged in the history, in the history of a house with a central courtyard typology. So instead of detaching the different elements and moments of the building, we work with all its parts creating a system of patios, increasing the interiors and exteriors, mixing concepts of public and private, allowing us to think the hotel as a continuous exterior environment or as seen through a slaughtered um, image, uh, an expansion of a world interior, an endless domestic landscape in the case in this case, defined by rooms, passive technologies, objects, and where the luxury hotel is being redefined, where public and private are thresholds all along the exterior to its interior. The room was understood as a blank canvas, 
for the handcrafted materials were stone, steel, glass, and terrazzos, are matched with the originals as well as with the original walls, freeing the space of unnecessary ornaments. Objects were defined as essential tools or as furniture and decorations at the same time, resembling the, sh the shakers, woodwork tradition. So going back to the question of what are the essential elements, the courtyard was used as a system and an adjacent element in the definition of each room, as well as the public, as well as the main courtyards, the public restaurant, where the public restaurants and retails are. Subtracting functional um, parts along the building, the courtyards mediate the relationship between the public and the private, connecting also with light and air, becoming an extension of the view of the room. And trying to, to suggest that luxury is this, the possibility of letting light, air, and natural ventilation and the, the touch of nature. So if we jump again to the almost uh, banal care of oneself, to the Greek care, to the individual care, to the care that Carl Gilligan explains in the ethics of care, where taking care of the body should always be in the beginning of oneself. But this, as she mentioned, is selfish. Then she proposes to have a sense of responsibility and to take care of others, relating um, ourselves to the background relegating ourselves to the background, even if that supposes a self-sacrifice in exchange of the welfare of the other. Gilligan's final answer is more appropriate at this point than at any time, finding the balance between caring for oneself and caring for others. The reason of bringing this ideology is perhaps to read it in a different way, to reinterpret it to another scale, where the one is the human race and the other is our relationship with other forms of life. In other words, words the oneself here would be humanity, thus humanity would be the environment. Let us turn the lens to architecture and, and to acknowledge architecture also as a body, understood, understood as an embodiment. Then we might start to think what does architecture touch and does not touch? what it relates to and where it withdraws from. Because architecture should always be rethought, readdressed, to rethink present architectural limits and urban classifications that were used to assure benefits in detriment, in detriment of social rights, even more in the lack of, of environment rights. We have talked about well-being, care of our own body, how air, water, and nature are essential when luxury is reframed, and I like to reimagine, to imagine as if confinement and this confinement time had made us return to the primitive cabin of Marc Antoine Laurier, the one that understands architecture as a shelter and a refuge, but with a further influence um, within the political, the economical, and the environmental at large, connected from the common space and service, uh, services that are linked at micro and at micro and, mic and macro scale. Perhaps understanding architecture as a body could give us the possibility to see architecture caring for life and also caring for others. Through that, we might give space to address other forms of life, to imagine architecture working as an agent that mediates the relationship um, between plants and humans interconnected with the soil and the plants, exposed to the earth and drastic weather, a space to nurture and observe an endangered species called Guayacan, a tree that is, a tree that is found along the Pacific coast, mainly in warm weather. To cultivate and to work with these species, begin at, being at a, low, at a low risk of extinction, it was necessary to constitute a legal framework to obtain the federal approval, approval of the government. So the project was framed inside an ecological management unit, Unidad de Manejo Ambiental. The Guayacan Pavilion was thought as a threshold, as a space for mediation. Inside it, plants are the first to take place. They are kept to the level of the ground. While while the human activity is pushed one meter below earth as an act of disarticulation. 
Such action gives the possibility to observe, to touch, and care for the ground, for the sprouts in, better pos in, in a better position to do so. It also con concentrates the humidity that is emerging from the wet ground, creating an enhanced micro weather for the plant. The threshold is marked by a flood that slab and water deposit. It's kind of a fountain that recognizes the intertwined relationship of the tree and the water. It also provides the only space for shadow for the human, for the, for the workers or the visitors. The rest of the space is just for sun air along the plantation bed. An empty space that evidences the transition between rains and drought. As Gilligan, as Gilligan said, each place has tried to take care of those to of those close to it. Those, thus, we must extend our understanding of the other, as well as our relationship to shared spaces. How, what are, is the other that also take care of by respecting it. How we have become to think or to relate to our bodies or other bodies ought to open up our awareness. With this in mind, I would like to share with you this last project, one that reflects on spaces of confinement, on a space of possibilities, and of a promenade that invites the visitor to be aware of their body as it walks through it. The project offers the user an experiential response, consisting of the activation of all the senses that accompany their movement. It is therefore an open exhibition, an exhibition that was um, based on the, on the Venice Vinyl exhibition. And we brought the murals back to Mexico. Well, we brought the murals to Mexico. And then it, 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 it was an open exhibition, open in so far as it depends on the visitor's own experience to make sense and to be perceptive in its entirety. In so far as it ends, and encloses in the interaction with the visitor. It is a place for each person and it is a different place each time it is visited. To go through the installation, it means to immerse in the, in a succession of scales and voice. The vacuum and the large scale offered by the gallery is followed by the comprehension, the compression um, the compression of the, of the interior curved surfaces. And thus, in turn, it is followed by a voice delimiting the orthogonal mural. Once the curved area are, is accessed, the visitor becomes aware of their presence. It shows the reflection. At a moment, the subject can only look at himself and recognize himself as a wayfarer in the space between the curved and orthogonal surface. A space that emulates two faces of the human being, the rational and the, the rational and the irrational. The first link to Cartesian order and orthogonality, the second to the curve and bent to the complexity. The last threshold um, takes the visitor inside a contained space framed by the murals of the territory. The two parallel murals delimit the orthogonal void. Apparently the same, these two murals force the visitor to recognize the territory as their own, as part of their self. In both, the territory of Mexico is naked for the visitor. And it does so through its crudest orography and bathymetry. Carved in stone, the Mexican territory is exhibited from materiality more than from emptiness showing its topographic nature through the tectonic dimensions of the stone. Therefore, all possible reflection on the territory is made starting from the geography and not its history. It is the naked body of the land that is inhabited. In the opposite panel, um, inside, the, inside the, 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 the pavilion, the course pavilion, there, there is the mural that has carved an empty fragment, but only in those sections devastated from natural and anthropo anthropophic forces, evidencing in a concrete and material way 
the regions of extreme poverty, harmful transformations, or the inexorability of, human, of natural disasters. The exhibition attempts to a journey towards the immersion of a self-conscious subject in the geographical collectivities previously described by, by Humboldt. Nature, climate, natural catastrophe, catastrophes, and topographic wealth and social and individual. The objective knowledge of nature and its resources is intertwined with the subjective vision of social life. Since both dimensions are inseparable and, and exert permanent influence on one another. Thus, a place, mural of the territory, is a serene journey from the individual to, to the collective. To, to conclude on this, on the ideas presented tonight, and perhaps what um, I've been sort of like trying to, to share with you, it's it's more of an invitation to think about the body and the bodies we inhabit, about the cost effects of human impact on natural ecosystems, about the different scales that one body permeates into another. It is also an invitation to, to break the limits of architecture, to comprehensively reprogram and reinterpret present typologies that give power and form on the political, the economical, and the environmental at large. With this in mind, to be aware of the multiple scales on which our decisions can impact. And thank you. Sorry that I sort of like ran through the presentation. Um, but I look forward to any comments or questions and to hear Marcos and respond. Thank you very much, Gabriella. I, uh, absolutely hypnotic work. And uh, um, I have a hundred questions for you. And, uh, but uh, before I do that, I just wanted to uh, uh, throw it to the students and faculty to, uh, to see what sorts of uh, interventions and questions you uh, might have of your own. There is one question here. It says, how has Mexico inspired your creativity? How has Mexico, sorry, started what? How has Mexico inspired your creativity? Um, I'm not sure I could say it inspires um, creativity, but I'm sure it's permeated in the work. Um, perhaps this idea uh, or this um, understanding through like the different periods that Mexico has gone through in the history from pre-colonial, post-colonial, um, and seeing that take shape in architecture, it's, um, it's sort of like um, influencing in the work. And it is because of that reason of perhaps of being um, colonized that I think architecture should constantly question about um, the notions of limits and the typologies that give power to certain structures and also the, um, the, the discipline as, a, as presenting different realities more than um, or as trying to understand different realities more than architecture being a reality on its own. Gabriela, I was, uh, if there aren't any other uh, questions from our audience, I, uh, I was gonna go ahead and press ahead with my own. So um, uh, I'm, I am checking the chat, so please, uh, if uh, anyone in the audience has a question, please, uh, please uh, go ahead, and and I will, of course, make uh, make make space. I am um, 
I'm super interested in uh, how aspects of your talk connect to um, to the spatial conditions and social conditions and embodied conditions uh, that uh, are, are are forced on us by the pandemic. And I, you know, like many people who are interested in Mexico City, I'm of course familiar with your work. And um, one thing that I know about your work is that so much of it is focused on um, uh, domestic uh, spaces and a super careful calibration of domestic space to say material effects or light effects, air effects. And it occurs to me that it, that the, that the that the pandemic, and of course it has uh, uh, occurred to many of us, that, that the pandemic has kind of supercharged the domestic space and perhaps asked it to do something that it was never asked to do before. And of course that connects to your lecture, I think, when you start talking about the monastic life you're describing, but also almost the zero level of domesticity that you showed in the furnishings for your hotel, as if every single stick of furniture, as important as it was to the spiritual and spatial life of the shakers, is now somehow part of our own home self-medication domestication that we live in now. Um, can you just, can you just uh, maybe comment on how the pandemic might invite a rereading of your domestic projects? Um, yes, well, it certainly has sort of like diluted everything that used to be a limit with the public life um, or the exterior life. Everything sort of has um, dissolved in the fluids of the domestic landscape. And with this, um, I'm not sure yet how it's going to turn into the new project um, related to this program, but it certainly has raised questions about um, the essentials. And, and with this in mind, how important it is to bring um, like and just to to present an example, and um, we've been sort of like questioning or being happy that we're in Mexico and we weren't in our small apartment in New York when all this happened because here their connection to an exterior life is in at least in the in most of the projects we have done and the one that we live in it's always like be looking as well those borders of interior and exterior. And most of the projects that we, um, when we conceive them, we cannot see them without this condition of getting a sense of, uh, of a green space that even though Mexico City and most of the central um, urban areas are quite dense, we always find the, find the space to how to sort of like subtract and, and connect to, to that exterior life. And, I guess these these conditions about being in the open air as a safer space in terms of um, having the ventilations and the and and it's supposed to be safer than in indoor spaces that does not have the the proper quality of ventilation. Um, I'm sure it's going to reflect just as in the modern times. Um, with with other needs, it's sort of like reflected as well this um, this condition of the space to need to that needed to be super clean and almost in a kind of like um, hospital sense of environment. And I'm not like I cannot answer your 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 question, but I think we've been thinking about how to make this more dr drastic in a way of like bringing in the exterior to the interior. And it's something that has been happening with the home office and different, uh, and with the technology that we're involved now that architecture has um, given us. Like the public spaces are not the ones changing so much, but how we live in those public spaces. And I guess our homes now are a public space. It's a public space now that we are always connected and. And we're sort of like showing that um, 
life that is behind us. And just now putting, like saying this out loud, it reminded me of um, some of the work of Beatrice Colomina, where she always um, talks about the, the bed being now the public space and probably even the streets being more private in order that um, you bring someone to your bed um, at any meeting if you're sitting there and working, but you don't touch with all the people that you, uh, and you, but if you want to touch someone, you go out to the street and you meet with that person. So somehow this sort of like, um, this, the illusion, um, the solve things or the, the undifferentiated continuum of exterior and exterior of public and private is something that um, I hope architecture or us as architects uh, will be able to to express or to 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 represent at a certain moment. I I I confess when you were talking about the links between bodies and I guess the last quarter of your lecture, you were talking about um, well, I'm not sure if exactly if you describe what those links or connections might be, but mm -hmm. I superimpose Marshall McLuhan and I just imagine a kind of extension of the human body that would connect people across you know, distances and which which seems to be a kind of embodiment, if you if you like, of the connection itself, where we are able to produce a kind of social body across uh, across distances. Um, but I, I, I leave that for you to work out because I'm not sure exactly yeah. how that embodiment might work. Uh, and yet it seems to be working perhaps without our quite understanding it already. Um, but anyway, uh, um, I, I, I did want to uh, uh, take a moment uh, because um, uh, Dean Curry did have a question for you, uh, which I will, I guess I'll read it. Um, I'll read it, yeah, I'll read it. Okay, okay. Uh, and the question is, uh, could you please discuss how architectural representation was, is, and remains, or remains colonial in the way it uh, charges the representation of the colonized uh, through European modernist uh, derived visual languages? Or conversely, um, do you believe that cartography, which you use a lot in your work, is or becomes an emancipatory visual tool for getting at more authentic and theoretical articulation of subjectivity. Okay, I think there are a couple of questions in that question. So, um, I think architecture um, has traditionally been used as a tool that perpetuates colonial processes. And it's it's been effective because of, of the way we sort of like give power to those um, monuments or spaces. And I guess um, through architectural representation, and it perhaps has to do with your last comment about how we can be all interconnected. I think um, the language that we have or the tools with technology and the, the data that we can read and and represent um, in a different, not in a different way, but that we can represent in order to communicate um, an overlay of information. Um, I think through those kind of like research um, that end up taking form um, of maps or drawings or, or, or of complex representations, architecture sort of like becomes more than just the, the, the project on its own. Like there's a lot of like information there that can synthesize or express or establish in order to, to look beyond the power structures or to make evident those power structures that, that, that get established in in the constructions or in the way we live. And I guess like when we approach architecture, we know that there's like a timeless condition in it. 
but somehow it's always like we're always rooted in the contemporary so as you said like maybe we're not being able to to express today what it should be a representation or what architecture should become or take form but at some point it will be it will show that root those roots of um, how we used to live and how um, digital technology and the new social behaviors um, modify some assumptions of what um, architecture is supposed to be. I'm not sure if I um, got lost. I think I completely got lost in the question, but I think, but I hopefully I got a couple of the things that um, the Dean was asking. Um. I'm sure he'll let me know in the chat. Um, uh, uh, I do have another question from uh, uh, from I think uh, the students. Uh, one is uh, uh, in the beginning you mentioned uh, murals. Uh, would you mind going over the significance between architecture, uh, uh, architecture and muralism again? Um, and I'll just hijack that question in a sense because I was also wondering the same thing, but. Uh, also in regard to the, say, um, to the kind of revolutionary project of murals in Mexico. Um, anyway, that's uh, the question from the student. Well, for those of you who have been to Mexico or um, and Mexico City and been to the campus at UNAM, there are these incredible murals at the library and at different um, buildings that express conditions um, sort of uh, sort of like a like a shout or like a trying to 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 express in general what was the situation in the revolution and how the the lack of and uh, like how these revolutions seem to solve social problems but in fact there were even more and they were still there. So the, the muralists act in a way to present um, things that needed to be said in terms of the identity, the national identity. And it, they're full of, um, of color and contrasting symbolisms of, of different realities. And the way we decide, the, the reason we, why we decided to use uh, or yes, to use the to use murals with information on those murals for the Venice Biennale, it's because we acknowledge that today we need to rethink the identity um, that we're presenting in those kind of like forums. Like the Venice Biennial, it's a it's a Spain full of limitations to properly talk about um, what architecture should be addressing, and it somehow reflects the condition of each um, nation in terms of their understanding or the possibilities to open up certain concerns to an international audience. So the, the fact of using, uh, of presenting the information through murals, it was sort of like um, in this need of, 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 um, of freedom to express other concerns. And for that project, we needed to present 21 um, contemporary projects. And within those, it was like Barragan, which is not an art, a contemporary architect. It's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a, an, a great architect and, a le and his work is a legacy in, in architecture in general. But we somehow questioned the need to keep on presenting architecture through plans, drawing sections from how in Mexico has been presented um, architecture in those forums or, the, or issues of architecture. So we use the murals in order to that, to, to, to express a different reality, to try to talk about like where is the social um, uh, concerns or the environmental concerns and how we see architecture um, within these larger connections and, and and architecture more of, more of, a, of a system. And also the, the murals on its own work well in order to confine the space, leave an open space, but that it could also be contained 
and to create sort of like um, circulation for different ways of being able to to go through the exhibition. It was also um, the elements that we use murals and 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 walls in that sense. One of the one of the uh, I'm gonna just one last kind of go around at that that the 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 audience's question there, but one of the most fascinating things about muralism in Mexico um, is is that is that the mural has such a special orientation to say the market or to capital that somehow by being up on a building it it can't be as easily traded or owned or sold. Um, and so there's a kind of hat trick of some kind that architecture plays where just by the involvement of architecture, it somehow frees the mural from the marketplace by being, being attached to it. I, I have uh, another question that I, uh, from the audience and, um, and it goes as follows. And this is back to our conversation about the pandemic. And it says, following up on designing for the pandemic, what do you think about the challenge of finding solutions for what we need in the immediate future that can age gracefully in say 25 years when things will be different? Um, it's I love that very question. specific. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think you can answer that one, Marcos? <laughs> No? Uh, when I give a lecture <laughs> in Mexico City, maybe, yeah. Okay. Um, um, finding solutions for what we need in the immediate future. Um, well, the way I would answer this question is that, um, as I, and as I said in, or tried to share it in the, in the presentation, is that I think we should really question what are the essential needs in in architecture and maybe not only in architecture in the way we live in how we're feeding um the different systems and how to be more aware of what role we play in those in that larger scale of of the um, of the of this contrast in um, about nature and human traits. And I guess um, like if we look towards, uh, towards the immediate scale, um, I think the way we live and the way we act, it can only reflect in the, in the local scale, like the, the changes or the impact would be seen in an immediate scale. But if we look through the things that we're doing uh, in, in for civilization and deforesting and areas and extracting resources and that impact it's changing radically in the long term and how we're going to live so i don't think we have a as architect or at least i don't feel as architect i have that possibility of designing something immediate for the future. I think we have to rethink completely um, architecture as a system, but also as citizens, what is it that we, um, how is it that we actually live? Like, where do we get our food from? Like to be more aware of all these infrastructures that we have to create in order for the life we, we live on. Um, all this huge network that um, that is eating up the entire planet. So in that sense, um, I, th I think we really have to, to rethink the political system, the economical system, our social system, like everything. And architecture, it's, it's, um, it's someone that makes these structures alive. So like, let's not continue on hiding all the threads that are behind architecture and start to make them more evident and be more conscious about um, all the threads that are hidden. Speaking of aging gracefully, uh, one, uh, just one kind of concluding comment, I, I hope 
Uh, I'm not stretching your patience, but just the, the idea of thinking of the uh, U.S.-Mexico border uh, as an eco zone is also fascinating because it would be an eco zone with uh, that's shot through by architecture of walls and berms and mm -hmm. um, different marks of human transformation, as well as all the surveillance uh, technologies, tunnels, pathways, and all the rest. Um, and um, it would, I imagine, um, I guess with the election that's happening right now, perhaps it is something that at least parts of it would fall into ruin and, and maybe age gracefully in the way that the, uh, that the, the commenter was asking uh, about earlier. Um, but it, it, makes me, it makes me wonder how that eco zone in your mind would include all of the architectural interventions that have been made for so long to mark that line or that kind of thickened zone that you're describing. Um, I the, the the way I understand an echo zone, it's it's it has like different perspectives. But on the one hand, um, it should be a space that sort of like absorbs, um, as in biology, um, one ecosystem with another ecosystem and creates a new ecosystem. It's not about like that sort of like borderline when there's A and B, but how A and B start creating like C, B and different elements. So in terms of, of like architecture as a, as a typology, um, it's something that we ought to be questioning and sort of like reprogramming and also, well, typology and program. And I think, um, as you said before, uh, or has been said before, the like the radical change is not really on how we relate to each other on the use of of, of the city itself, but how the um, the technology and the and the new social behaviors are modifying the way we interact. And I guess the the digital platforms that are expanding the limits of the house or the or this conference that I'm not sure where we are at now, and um, like each one of us in our homes, but like this platform, this way of like connecting different environments. Um, it's thanks to this digital landscape and how architecture is becoming network and how in a border that's going to sort of like embrace all those differences. Um, I'm not sure there's like a, a right answer. I think we have to test it and we have to, to expand the, like that notion of a limit. Well, testing and expansion. I think that's a um, it's a beautiful place to uh, to pause. And um, uh, Gabriella, I want to thank you so much for uh, for the really amazing uh, set of ideas that you presented, and uh, and then um, hope to uh, talk to you more about them. Uh, and I will then uh, uh, pass it over to the dean um, for for his own comments. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. That's great. Uh, and really wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great um, pleasure to hear about your work and your thoughts on uh, contemporary architecture and history and uh, just very richly weaving in a lot of things. So uh, we're very appreciative of that. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, have a great night. Thank you.